First, why don't we talk a little bit about the products that, that each of you guys have built uh, for those who aren't familiar with it. So let's start with SoundCloud. I know I wrote about you guys back in 2008. Yep. Uh, when you were, it was going to be a, a tool t for industry professionals to share their music with, it sounded like other people in the industry and right. maybe close friends, but it, it wasn't something that sounded like it was directed towards consumers. It, you guys have sort of evolved from there, right? Right, yeah. So I think, I mean, the easiest way to think about SoundCloud today is really like we're trying to build the uh, sound sharing platform of the web. So in many ways, the same way that Flickr works for photos or the way that YouTube works for videos. So we're trying to do that same thing, but for sound. Um, we came from starting off building specific tools for pro, semi-pro music creators. Um, it's expanded quite a bit since then. We're still really focused on the creator side, and I think that sets us apart from, from a lot of other companies out there. We're really interested on you know, people that create in sound. But what's happened now is that we've seen that it's not just pro, semi-pro people that create sound anymore. Like, a lot of people are creating music, but also other kinds of sound content as well. So, you know, sound tweets, um, you know, audio books, any kind of sound imaginable. So it's really becoming that sharing platform for any kind of I sound. I know one of the kind of defining features of, of your site is that you can look at a waveform of, of the audio file and actually comment yeah. on a particular section saying, I really like this guitar solo or, or whatever. Yeah. Okay. And, and Steve, you want to give us just a, a brief outline of, of what sound tracking is? Sure. Uh, so sound tracking is an iOS app today and uh, in the future uh, will be available on Android as well. Um, but uh, Sound tracking is, a, is an iOS app that lets you share uh, the music you're experiencing or listening to um, with a photo and a location, as well as your own commentary, unless you post that uh, simply to Facebook, Twitter, and Foursquare. So at, at its core, it's sort of a, a self-expression geotagging app for music and uh, allows you to um, check in music um, if that's sort of where you're coming from from a Foursquare perspective. But uh, I think a lot of our users kind of use it across Facebook and Twitter as well. So given that this, this panel, and it's not super long, so we're going to actually skip most of the issues of the music industry and all the barriers they put up toward innovation, because uh, everyone always talks about that. And I want to I focus primarily on, on the social stuff, because I feel like social is a word that's tossed around as something that just kind of fixes everything. And when it comes to music, I'm sort of curious as to, to how useful it actually is. And if, I think part of the issue is that social, since the rise of Facebook, people tend to, to think that means doing things with your friends. And maybe I'm a jerk, but I don't really care about my friend's music taste. I mean, I know there are a handful of friends who I might trust in terms of their taste, but if you know, my buddy listened to some Screamo album or something, don't care, right? So is, is the social, is the thing that's going to make social important to music, is it going to be sharing it with friends or sharing with people who have similar taste to you whether or not you actually know them. Well, I, I think like for us, it's actually it's a different part that's that's really interesting. So, I mean, we look at there's we look at you know um, creation of music and sound becoming so simple that it's almost you know at the point where it's as simple as taking a photo. You know, anybody can be creating stuff. And if you think of that and then apply social to it, it becomes really powerful because, you know, being able to create something at an instant is great. Like take a photo, put it on your phone, that's great. But unless you share that with the world and unless, you know, you get some feedback, some reaction from the world, that moment is not going to be that valuable for you, that meaningful. So for us, like we see all these great companies building tools for making it simple to create. And we, through our API, like we plug in the sharing component for that. And that's key for the user to feel that it was a meaningful experience. Like I made something today, I shared it, I got some people that listened to it, that you know commented on it. So that, that sort of creates this like this loop somehow of creating, getting feedback, being excited, wanting to create again. So for us like that's the really, really interesting part with social. Um, and not so much on, this, on the consumption side of it. Because I think the issue is that, and I, I totally see the value in that, social, uh, you see this on Facebook every day, if people are responding to, to content you created and a status update a photo, it's a good feedback loop. It feels yeah. good when people like that or comment on it. And obviously, if you're a music creator, you know, I can see why you'd want to do that. But if you're sharing an album that you had nothing to do with in the creation of, right? It's just a new album. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of wondering how much value there is to that. And Steve, maybe you can talk a little about this. Yeah, so I think, I think there's... I think when people talk about social music, they think about how does this improve music discovery? Mm -hmm. And that's definitely a valid use case. A lot of people look to, whether it's Pandora or it's Last.fm or it was to MySpace or even Facebook and YouTube, they're looking for a lot of uh, social validation and, and recommendation. 
But I think there's another part of social music that hasn't really been tapped into as well. I think there were um, my old company iMeme and companies like Mux Tape, um, and uh, uh, there were a, a several different sort of more, to, more uh, social expression apps out there. Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of those are less about music discovery for music's sake, but music discovery for you know people's sake. So was, the, the idea is that um, I can get a better picture or better um, uh, a better idea of what someone is experiencing at that moment emotionally or going through in their life or where they are, where they're traveling or where they're hanging out um, through the lens of music. And I think that's what a lot of uh, mobile apps are trying to do today. If you look at a lot of the mobile sharing apps such as our app, Sound Tracking, and other apps that are um, bubbling up right now, um, it's about uh, self-expression, using music as the way to tell that story. I think that's what's exciting right now with social. So, you know, I think there are some people that um, really don't care for other people's music taste. Me. Um, and there are people that do. Um, and so for, for um, people like in your taste, um, you can actually explain, hey, I'm sitting here you know, on the High Line um, and I'm uh, walking during the sunset and the setting and, and here's a song that kind of represents um, what my emotional um, state is right now. Walking on Sunshine by Katrina and the Waves or something. But, uh, all right. It sounds like what you described, though, isn't going to be the solution to the record industry problems, though, as far as selling more content, exposing people to, to more music they're interested in, right? It might give you another way to connect with your friends, to, to experience what they're experiencing, but is that really going to drive more sales? I don't know if I agree with um, uh, your assumption there, because music is always, uh, you know, music sales are declining, but I think what's been great about music in general, outside of just sort of business economics, has been and music um, uh, definitely markets and sells other things very well. Mm -hmm. It sells um, beverages, it sells cars, it sells all these other things, movies even, and TV shows. So I feel like um, there's an opportunity to really like, explore that area where, you know, for us it's geotagging music and being able to um, have people have the power to do that right from their phone. Mm -hmm. And so if they're able to do that and you're able to think about you know, where music taste is happening in real time across a map, across locations, that opens up a whole new set of data that hasn't been out there. So we're at the very beginning of this, and there's several companies working on this. But if you think about that music interest graph, and you lay it out over a, 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 a territorial map, and you look, you're looking at lat long coordinates, um, it starts to get interesting. Where are people listening to this music? What neighborhoods? Um, what are their how are their tastes differing from you know between Williamsburg and the Mission District? in San Francisco versus the marina and Upper West Side, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think we're just at the beginning of really capturing a lot of new data that hasn't existed out there. So that's important for all of us, but it's also important for um, the music industry as well. So Alexander, going back to, to SoundCloud, have there been any interesting trends that you guys have seen on the night? Because you guys are really sort of a, a social network all around mu original music, I guess you could say, as opposed yeah, to original previously sounds. recorded music. Are there any interesting trends you guys have seen there that, that maybe could be applied to, to these more popular tracks that we see out there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like one of the really big things that are happening around larger artists is that, you know, they're noticing how, how widespread it is for other people to be creating stuff as well. And they can build massive engagement with people by having other people sort of collaborate on their tracks, uh, you know, applications for remixing it, um, getting parts of tracks, making their own version with it, um, and things like that. And, and that seems to be like a really great way for driving strong, deep engagement with, uh, with fans. We had this, um, this track that Imogen Heap did, which was super cool. She, like, she asked people to go out and uh, record sounds from their day and sent her that would be inspiring. So they would just like, capture stuff on their phone, share it her for a few hours. She got about 800 sounds, I think, you know, ice cubes in a glass, water pouring, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then she makes a track out of it and puts that track up online. You have links to every single uh, piece of sound that's actually been involved with that. And, you know, getting, getting into that kind of an interaction, that sort of bi-directional thing with an artist is a massive thing for a fan. Is this, right? is this something you're seeing many major, I, I know that's, that's actually a really cool example, but are you seeing a trend where 
major artists are comfortable sharing music before it's done, before it's gone through all the production and everything? Because I know yeah. many art artists are self-conscious about that. Sort right. Of thing, right. Yeah. No, I think like I think it, it's always you know artists are different, right? So so it, it's it, it depends. But we're seeing we're seeing it really as a trend across many artists. I mean, I, the other day I woke up, you know, I checked my dashboard on SoundCloud, and I have a track from 50 Cent mm -hmm. where he's just rapping and he's like asking everybody to produce a track out around it. So I pull up my iPad, I make a track around the 50 Cent track on my iPad, share that back to the world, and it's just like it's a completely different way of interacting around sound and music than, than it has been before. Um, and, and I think like going back to you know, a little bit just of how, how that connects with you know, the mu music industry in general, I think you know, the music industry is at a better place now than it's ever been before. Like artists are more excited about music and how they can engage with people than ever before. Like the people that say that it's dystopic, they're only looking at you know, the decline of recorded music. Whereas actually like the music industry today isn't just about recorded music, it's about you know, Deadmau5 just released a new uh, iPhone application that allows anybody with a couple of clicks to make a track based on some stuff that he's done and then share it through SoundCloud. Like that's, that's like gaming, right? They are almost looking at instrument markets and all of that. All of that is part of the music industry today. Um, and if you look at that whole thing, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to be. All right, so I think unfortunately we're out of time again. But thank you guys for joining us. It's been really insightful. And thank you, everyone. All right. Okay, terrific. Thanks a lot, guys. All right, next up we have Michael Ranieri, the CEO of Zecco, and Mikhail DeBoer, the Director of Technology. And he's going to show us a quick demo of something he's launching right here on stage. Zecco is uh, online trading uh, service.